what is ransomware? What is it? How does it work? And how do we defend ourselves so that we can, um, you know, resist it when it uh, when the attackers are trying to attack us? And in case we are attacked, how do we recover um, uh, gracefully? Right. Okay. So. Um, so let's start off with a little bit of humor, <laughs> uh, which is basically saying that, you know, malware spares no one. Um, so as you can see in this cartoon that I picked out, uh, this is a meat processing plant. And, um, and so instead of producing meat products, uh, let me just turn down the volume on my side so that uh, I don't hear the translation. But um, so this is a meat processing plant. And um, just a minute, let me see if I can turn down my volume because otherwise it's getting a little difficult for me to speak. Uh, just a moment. I wonder how I'm going to turn down the volume on my side. Um, let's see. Uh, sorry. Okay, well, let me just uh, move on. So, so here in this meat processing plant, uh, you know, the two workers, they are a little confused. They're seeing that the conveyor belt, sí, instead of uh, producing meat products, sonido, it's actually turning out uh, la... corn and carrots and, uh, uh, and broccoli. So they think that they've been hacked. Yeah. So, so this is meant to be funny, but it's not really funny. Um, organizations of various types across the world, you know, they're getting attacked with uh, malware and specifically ransomware. And um, it's, it's very difficult for, for these companies to figure out how to resist and uh, you know, recover from these. So that's what we're going to be talking about. And so to start out, you know, some recent uh, ransomware attacks, even as we speak to the month of July, and, um, over the past two or three months, there have been several high-profile um, uh, attacks, you know, on using ransomware. And, um, and so let's talk about the first one in May of 2021, the Colonial Pipeline attack. Uh, this is a major U.S. energy company. And because of the ransomware attack, they were forced to shut down their entire fuel distribution pipeline. Um, and as a result, you know, the gas and jet fuel distribution across the U.S. East Coast was severely hampered. And in fact, I forgot to mention, you know, I'm uh, speaking from Washington, from the Washington DC area in USA. Um, so um, in my case, you know, for us, we were quite uh, in, a, in quite a panic because of the shortage of, um, of ga gasoline at gas pumps. And um, through investigations, it was found that a, a group called Darkside was responsible for this attack. And uh, they and the um, uh, Colonial Pipeline Company had to pay uh, $5 million in ransom. Uh, thankfully, uh, the law enforcement folks were able to uh, recover most of that ransom money um, in subsequent weeks. And then in the month of June, in early June, another a large U.S. company called JBS uh, was attacked with ransomware. And uh, this is actually the largest meat supplier um, in the world, as far as I uh, what I've read. And um, because as soon as they detected the ransomware, they uh, took precautions and took all of their systems online immediately and stopped work um, uh, until they figured out how to recover. And uh, they found out that the Russian cyber gang Revel was responsible. And um, about $11 million uh, of ransom was paid through Bitcoin. And then just this month, earlier this month, the company Kaseya was uh, attacked with ransomware. Um, and uh, as many of you know, Kaseya produces a software product that uh, supports, that provides some um, remote monitoring and management of IT assets. And so uh, this uh, this was again from the Revel Group, uh, but the ransomware spread from MSPs, which, which are managed service providers, you know, companies that provide outsourced IT services to other um, businesses. So about 1,500 businesses worldwide were impacted through these MSPs and their clients. So this was an example of ransomware, uh, um, you know, through supply chain, um, through an authentication bypass. But um, but anyway, this was quite devastating. And in fact, um, you know, as a company, Electrosoft, our company, we use a managed service provider that uh, is using Kaseya. So on a daily basis, we uh, are getting updates on where they stand, where our MSP stands with respect to the recovery 
from this ransomware attack. So it, it, it's hitting very close to home, I have to say. <laughs> okay, so the next slide is um, uh, about, you know, what is ransomware, right? What is it? So ransomware, you know, I've used the term several times and many of you are probably familiar with it, but just to, you know, make sure that we have all of the audience uh, coming along with us, it's a type of malware um, that compromises the data or systems, you know, within an um, organization. But the single goal of ransomware uh, is really to extort money, is to extort uh, a ransom payment from the victim company. And so, you know, in the physical world, uh, we've all heard of kidnappings and, um, uh, you know, people getting taken hostage and stuff. And so usually the bad guys, they demand a ransom to, uh, to let the kidnapping victim go or to let the hostages, you know, release the hostages. Um, so it's kind of the same thing. It's just that um, in ransomware, uh, they're trying to get a ransom uh, and what they're holding hostage is really the data or the systems uh, of a company or an organization. And uh, so this kind of attack can be used uh, for various purposes. I mean, again, as I mentioned, the main goal is to uh, collect a ransom, right? Um, but how they do it is, uh, you know, it can have various ways. And most of the time they will scramble or, you know, encrypt the data and uh, not decrypt it until the ransom is paid. In some other cases, they might be actually stealing information or files and um, threaten to um, sort of release it to the wrong people or to the public, you know, unless the ransom is paid. But um, in any case, uh, typically there will be a ransom note which is left on the system, uh, uh, you know, to alert the company or the people involved that uh, now they're a victim and they have to do this. And so here's a little picture, I guess, a graphic of what such a ransom note or screen can look like. Um, and so, uh, so that's kind of how it, uh, how it works. Okay, so uh, malware versus ransomware. Um, so I've used both terms already several times uh, this morning, but um, ransomware is really a subset of malware. Malware is a much broader term. Uh, that's, uh, you know, I have a um, definition that I uh, got from a NIST publication. Um, so basically based on the definition, malware is software or firmware that is intended to perform an unauthorized process that will have adverse impact on the confidentiality, integrity, or availability of an organizational system. So anyway, that's a mouthful, but basically malware is the broader class of, you know, um, software firmware that can uh, have negative impact on your computer systems doing unauthorized activities. Um, and so some of the types include, you know, you could get malware, which is spyware, which is watching uh, what you're doing on the computer and maybe relaying that information to an outside party. Um, or a key logger, uh, in which case, you know, the actual keys that you're punching in will be, um, will be logged and then again shared with uh, some other, you know, remote party. And in that case, you know, they're trying to capture passwords and pins usually, um, or maybe even social security numbers. But, uh, you know, similarly, the, we've all heard of viruses, worms, you know, Trojan horse, uh, horses uh, in the cybersecurity realm, um, et cetera. So these are different types of malware. But one of the things about most malware, not necessarily ransomware, is that malware, um, you know, it tries to evade detection, right? Uh, so they want to hide and lurk in your network and on your system so that they have the luck to do what they are trying to do, which is in many cases steal information or sensitive information, you know, personal, personal information, et cetera. Ransomware is a type of malware, but um, but here, um, it's a malicious attack where attackers encrypt an organization's data and demand payment to restore access. That's the most typical um, scenario for ransomware. Um, and, but as I mentioned, attackers can also steal um, information from the car, from the organization and then demand payment so that for not disclosing it. You know, uh, the, the the difference. Uh, so one of the key differentiators for ransomware is that you know. Um, as it's trying to figure out what misdeeds to do, it is trying to evade detection, of course, just like any other malware. But um, when it does its deed, when it encrypts the files uh, and when it demands ransom, it's very much not uh, lurking. It is in your face, right? You cannot ignore it. So that's kind of a little bit of a difference, you know, between ransomware and malware. But 
uh, ransomware does not try to hide when it attacks you you will know and you you know uh, there's no uh, confusion whether this is an attack or not okay so then um this is a, a ransomware kill chain now the term kill chain was introduced by i believe some lockheed martin um um, you know, researchers uh, several years ago, and what they're trying to do is figure out, you know, um, uh, how to use the strategies and techniques that work for normal warfare, you know, like uh, actual uh, uh, wars and battles out in the field, and see if some of those same techniques can be used um, to um, defend against, you know, cyber attacks, right? And so the, the point is that if we know the phases or the uh, chain of events that will occur in a typical attack, then it is, uh, the more we understand about that chain of events, the better we can um, you know, thwart, be resistant to the attack and or recover from the attack, right? So for malware, this is a kill chain um, you know, that I've kind of put together based on you know, the actual sequence of things that happen. First, there is a discovery. You know, so the bad guys, they are trying to figure out, is this an organization even worth um, you know, attacking? Can they pay uh, the amount of ransom that you know, the bad guys are looking for? And also, they're trying to discover where are the vulnerable points? You know, what are the external facing um, IT systems that might have vulnerabilities? Or who are the users and how to dupe them? You know, how to trick them into um, clicking on a link, et cetera, right? So, so that's the discovery phase, but following the discovery phase um, is the entry phase where the bad guys are actually trying to inject the ransomware into the corporate network somehow. Now, if uh, the injection is successful, then the uh, one or more systems get infected and the ransomware installs on the local platforms. And so at that point, the ransomware has taken a foothold and it's trying to communicate with its, you know, big brother, big sister, whatever you want to call it, out on the internet, the command and control center, basically. Um, and then the command and control center sends a lot of directions on what the ransomware is expected to do. But it'll do what's called, you know, reconnaissance to try to figure out, now that it's inside the network, let's say, it's trying to figure out, um, like, where the vulnerability is inside the network or where are the high value files or systems that can be disrupted to collect the ransom. Um, once it uh, discovers the right uh, targets, then the phase of compromise starts where, um, you know, these files are compromised, meaning in typical cases, they might be encrypted with a key. Uh, and then the extortion phase starts where, you know, the next person who desires to open that file, for example, they will get a ransom note or that system itself might be locked and with a ransom note on the screen saying that, you know, you are now, um, you have now been attacked and you have to pay ransom and click on such and such a link and pay this much money. And so if the company pays up, you know, um, then uh, supposedly they have to trust, uh, but the attacker will provide the unlocking key, the decryption key, and, uh, you know, have, give the company the ability to restore operations, right? So that's the typical kill chain or sequence of operations for a ransomware um, um, attack. So um, this is a visual, you know, kind of showing a very typical scenario of the same thing. So as you can see here, here's the discovery phase, the bad guys trying to figure out how to attack uh, or whether it's worth attacking, you know, this company or organization. And then it's the entry point. And here in this case, in this example, the entry point is via email. So the emails either have a bad attachment or a bad link. And if the user, um, it's like a phishing attack basically, if the user is um, fooled into believing that they have to click the link or uh, open the attachment, then the computer gets infected and starts uh, communicating with its um, you know, command and control center out on the internet. Um, which sends it, uh, sends it various directions of what to do and uh, potentially an uh, encryption key. And so then starts the reconnaissance phase, you know, this computer using the privileges of the user who was attacked, um, starts scanning the accessible files and, you know, various assets on the network to see what is worth um, compromising, right? But when it finds it, it will use this encryption key lock these various types of, you know, um, assets or information, and uh, uh, and uh, the ransom note is, you know, uh, popped up and whatnot. And so at that point, the, uh, they're under extortion, right? So the organization then, let's say in this example, they decide to pay up. Um, 
And, uh, and you know, I mentioned that Bitcoin was used to pay uh, some of the ransom examples earlier. Now, the cryptocurrency and B Bitcoin is one example of cryptocurrency that has really helped ransomware to thrive because unlike before where, you know, without, without cryptocurrency, you can always trace the money and somehow get to the bad guys. But now, you know, with systems like Bitcoin, which are designed to be, um, to keep the uh, payers and pays anonymous, it is uh, pretty much, you know, nearly impossible to track the bad guys down through the money chain. But in any case, once the company pays up the ransom, then the decryption key is handed over, which can supposedly be used to unlock all these assets and, you know, uh, resolve the problem so that the company can continue operations, right? So again, understanding the kill chain, why that's important is because uh, then we can start thinking about what are the specific steps we can do to prevent these attacks from being successful, from happening in the first place. And then what are the things we can do uh, to react? So essentially there are two types of, you know, methods to defend ourselves. You know, some are proactive and some are reactive, right? Responsive. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Okay, so confidentiality. Okay, so this and this slide I was trying to show that, you know, ransomware, although most of us have read about ransomware attacks where data has been encrypted. Um, so that's just, you know, that's a typical one, but it's just one, one method of uh, um, sort of uh, making the organization pay up the ransom. Uh, but, you know, us cybersecurity professionals, we've learned from day one that, you know, the CIA triad is very important, right? confidentiality, integrity, and availability. That's what we're trying to ensure for the data and the systems that we protect. Now for a ransomware attack, you know, it may involve a confidentiality attack because and as I mentioned before, uh, they may be stealing sensitive files and data and threaten to reveal it unless the ransom is paid. Um, integrity attack is the more typical one that we've been reading about where maybe the uh, files are uh, you know, either corrupted or encrypted and uh, to make them unusable, and then uh, the, the attacker will restore those files only if the ransom is paid. And then the availability attack is uh, kind of based on most of the time the integrity attack, which is you know, the compromise of uh, critical data files, um, for example, may lead to applications and systems becoming unavailable. And so uh, critical services that were being provided by those applications and systems may have to stop, right? And so, the attackers uh, have figured out how to strike us on both the C, on all three C, I, and A angles to make us sit up and listen so that we, you know, we, and then ultimately create a sense of urgency so that we pay the ransom. Okay. So, um, so yeah, it's so now this slide I was, uh, you know, going to describe you know, how ransomware enters the organization. Remember the entry point and the infection um, kill chain phases. And so more often than not, um, the, uh, like the easiest way to inject uh, ransomware into an organization is by sending malware laden email uh, to uh, one or more people in the, in the organization and um, somehow fooling them um, uh, into either opening up the attachment or to click on a link that is in that email. But um, other methods of entry of ransomware could be just a random web browsing, you know, um, we all love the web. We click from one link to another link to another link. And so in all of that browsing, you know, we may be uh, sort of uh, led to a ma uh, malicious website and um, be downloading items from there without realizing it, right? And of course, when we download applications, uh, especially not unapproved applications within, from within the corporate network, we might be downloading rogue applications which are embedded with ransomware. Um, other methods of entry are through um, what I call vulnerable remote connections. So, you know, especially in COVID uh, days, for example, you know, most of us are working from home. Um, and so we might be uh, logging on to the, we might be connecting to the, you know, files for the company over VPN and such. And so many VPN, um, you know, servers, if they're not patched and up to date with their security, they become vulnerable to such attacks. and. Similarly, you know, remote desktop protocol, uh, RDP-based, um, you know, solutions are also many times vulnerable to attacks from the outside. Um, other ways of entry are, of course, you know, uh, obvious things. If you're connecting an infected system, you know, a system that already has the ransomware 
uh, infection. If you connect that to the uh, corporate network, of course, it's going to spread. And similarly, storage drives like thumb drives and such, you know, um, if you connect them uh, to your company uh, uh, laptop or computer, you know, it's going to spread. Okay. And uh, then once uh, the ransomware, you know, gets a foothold in uh, one of the com company's computers, and then how does it spread, right? So that's where the command and control center sends, uh, keeps sending it, um, you know, uh, instructions for how to uh, how to uh, look for vulnerabilities, how to identify targets and whatnot. And so as it does that, you know, it's really many times it's identifying and exploiting the vulnerabilities that are already in the network, you know, so maybe some internal servers and systems are not fully patched, for example, or they have insecure configurations. So those are the kinds of things that the ransomware client will be looking for to gradually sort of spread itself. And also, um, in most cases, the ransom client, you know, on the infected machine, uh, it is running with the um, uh, either super user or at least the privileges of the user who, you know, downloaded it, let's say. And so whatever access that user has to local drives or network or cloud drives and files, the ransomware will use that, you know, to, to kind of check out those files and do the reconnaissance. And as it does so, um, you know, again, the whole point is to um, whole point is to not uh, allow backups to happen from the local, uh, you know, copies, right? So it often deletes the backup copies from files that have obvious extensions uh, that indicate it's a backup file. Um, it disables backups uh, processes, and it also, uh, in many cases, disables the operating systems system recovery functions. You know, so that that's not an option when the ransom note is um, sort of popped up, right? So it's, it's they're very clever pieces of software, as you can see. Um, so on this slide, you know, I just wanted to kind of mention many of you probably have come across the NIST um, cybersecurity framework. By the way, NIST stands for the U.S. Uh, government's uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology. I should have mentioned that earlier. Um, uh, and uh, they put out a lot of guidance, uh, as many of you probably know. But uh, one of the things that they put out a few years ago is called the Cybersecurity Framework. It's a very simplistic but um, solid way to holistically look at a company's uh, security posture and improve it. And um, so anyway, so it has five basic steps, you know, identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. And so the point of the slide is to say that, you know, uh, ransomware is just one of many types of cyber attacks uh, out there. So um, following the NIST framework in its basic um, methodology, it, it absolutely is relevant. Okay, so then uh, let me get into some of the defense techniques, you know. Um, so again, so thus far, what have we discussed? We've discussed um, what is ransomware? Uh, how does it work? You know, the kill chain or the phases uh, it goes through for, for, for a typical ransomware attack. And, um, and then now we are gonna talk a little bit about, you know, how to defend ourselves, right? And I talked about uh, how the defense techniques could be proactive, you know, uh, preventive rather, and um, it could be um, reactive. So when the attack happens, we react and um, we do whatever we can, you know, to kind of recover from it, right? So one of the sort of uh, techniques, uh, you know, group of techniques rather, uh, which I called uh, good cyber hygiene, um, it applies to both the pro, you know, it's kind of the proactive or uh, preventive kind of um, uh, approach, let's say. But, uh, you know, uh, any company out there today, are pretty much, you know, we are using IT systems, we are on the internet, et cetera. So we all have to do what we can to maintain the security posture of our networks and our uh, systems, right? And so, um, so good cyber hygiene is very important in preventing uh, ransomware or any malware for that matter to take hold and really extract what they want from us. So things like, you know, ensuring that the company has um, secure configurations for their uh, desktops and their servers. Uh, timely patching is very important. You know, these operating systems and applications, they're so, so complex, you know, they're uh, hardly perfect, right? We all know that, uh, new vulnerabilities are um, um, uh, identified, uh, you know, every other day almost. And, and so the companies are obviously sending out patches to fix those uh, vulnerabilities as well as offer new uh, features and such. So timely patching is absolutely essential as any security person, uh, you know, knows. 
And then, of course, you know, it's good if that company or organization has a regular vulnerability scanning and, uh, you know, scanning program, meaning, you know, checking for where vulnerabilities um, and risks may lurk and then trying to remediate them, you know, as they find them. Um, of course, all of this is based on having uh, uh, established, you know, strong security policy for that organization saying what's allowed, what's not allowed, what they will do and what they won't do and enforcing those policies, you know, with the employees as well as the IT team. Now, one of the cyber hygiene uh, things, I mean, I've listed some random things, but these are probably the most important for ransomware. That's why I put them there. You know, another important hygiene um, topic is minimizing user privileges or following the least privilege principle. Now, again, most cyber folks are uh, familiar with that, um, with that term. It basically means that, you know, give users only the access or the privileges that they need to get their job done. No more. No, no less, of course, but no more than that, you know. So giving everybody access to everything is not the answer. Determine what are the roles in the organization, what sorts of areas of the file server or cloud area do they need access to and give them only that and no more. And this helps to limit, you know, if there's a ransomware attack, then it limits what that ransomware client uh, will have access to, right, of course. And similarly, uh, em employing network segmentation techniques, what happens is it creates, a, you know, tighter uh, sort of um, boxes around access, you know, like if the infection is, one, is in one segment, it will be limited to that segment rather than be able to uh, get into the other segments of the network and such. Okay, so another, uh, you know, broad class of techniques uh, is uh, related to user awareness and training. Now, you know, all of the examples that I've been kind of telling you about uh, for ransomware, it almost always involves um, fooling the user into doing something, you know, either they click on a link in the email or open the attachment or they're browsing to some unsafe site or they're downloading applications that they shouldn't be um, or they're connecting, you know, uh, thumb drives or uh, personal computer, you know, personal home computers on their company network. So, so user is like one of the weakest or the weakest uh, link in the chain, of course, you know, for any company when they talk about security. So training users and making them aware of the different types of attacks and telling, uh, helping them understand uh, why it's so important that they have to understand and guard against these attacks is important. So, of course, you know, things like uh, users should know about the security policies of the company or organization. They should absolutely be, you know, um, trained on phishing, how to detect it. And, you know, most companies run phishing exercises just to see who are vulnerable, who fall for it and who don't. And then, of course, unsafe browsing, you know, training users on the potential impacts of unsafe browsing or downloading applications from the internet, uh, connecting, you know, their own personal devices, etc. cetera. But um, a securing home network. Now at this point, um, why I put it in here is, you know, again, due to the pandemic, you know, uh, like never before, most people are now working from home. And so our corporate, um, you know, laptops and uh, desktops, they are now in our homes and connecting to our home network, right? And so uh, training users on um, some of the uh, low-hanging fruit and best practices for securing the home network, it goes a long way because it helps their company, um, you know, systems to be not attacked because of a weak home network, right? And then allow patching. Now, what that means here is that, um, you know, I mean, companies, most of the time, they want their laptops and their desktops to be patched, but uh, it... Uh, they don't just do it while the user is working, right? They schedule it or they um, sort of wait for a time when the user is not busy with that machine. But many times the users, if they want to, they can just, um, you know, uh, keep postponing the patching forever almost, you know, allowing this, their computer to become much more vulnerable over time because the relevant patches were not applied. Um, so, so yeah, training the user on how important it is to allow the patching schedules to, you know, to occur. And then final, final point there is, you know, training the users on how important it is to protect their um, authentication credentials, such as their passwords or um, not to share those or, you know, to have a, the, like a, a, a smart card or something, not to share that with anybody else, even within their family, et cetera. So how important it is to make sure that they and only they have access to 
uh, the authentication credentials, which in turn provide access to the corporate network, right? Okay, so again, this is a proactive measure, of course, you know, uh, helping the user be a little more careful in what they do and don't do uh, online. Okay, and so then um, uh, I call this class of techniques border control or perimeter protection, something like that. But essentially, you know, um, uh, like we have to, of course, train the user, but we can also have technologies and tools watching out, you know, on behalf of the user. So things like, you know, endpoint uh, protection or EDR um, uh, software, let's say endpoint detection and recovery software that sits on every endpoint, you know, such as laptops and um, servers, and they're constantly checking uh, for antivirus, you know, for, uh, you know, what's going on with the computer reporting back or you know, preventing bad things from happening. But also at the perimeter of the company, the email servers, uh, they can, um, can set them up to scan incoming emails before they're delivered to the inboxes of the individuals, you know, and scanning for things like, you know, um, dangerous links, um, bad attachments, et cetera, and preventing such, um, you know, such emails from even getting to the user's mailbox, of course, you know. And so it's like checking for spam, but of course not just spam, but, you know, dangerous spam, I guess. Uh, and then of course at the perimeter, you know, most companies they have, um, uh, they have ways to they use uh, tools to block access to known malicious websites so that while you're connected to the corporate network, you cannot access those those websites, you know, uh, you're blocked. And then finally, I call it a uh, border control, but, you know, using multi-factor authentication. Uh, that's like uh, one of the most important fundamental things to be done to secure the posture of any organization. But instead of just using passwords, which are, you know, notoriously insecure, use uh, two-factor authentication, maybe a password and a SMS message. Um, but honestly, to do do it well, you know, maybe use a stronger type of authentication, such as a smart card or a, um, or a cryptographic key-based uh, um, token, etc. So all of these, again, what are they trying to do is prevent uh, the entry, you know, the kill chain phase, which is the entry. Uh, they're trying to um, block that entry point, you know and for the virus to actually be effective or um, get in. Okay, so other um, and defense techniques, you know, this is more on the, well, it's proactive and reactive, but mostly reactive in this case, but um, uh, things like doing um, a security monitoring, you know, having the organization should have an active security operations center where they have um, a host of tools, you know, most uh, SOCs have a lot of different types of tools um, but that are um, sort of aggregating um, uh, event logs from the different servers and uh, watching network activity. And based on how these uh, SIEM, the SIEM, uh, SIEM uh, tools are set up, they will uh, do correlation to figure out, okay, this happened on this server as based on the event log. And this is the kind of network activity I'm seeing is that does that mean something funny is going on with the network? Somebody's trying to get in. So for example, you know, in the reconnaissance phase, um, I talked about how, uh, you know, the, um, the ransomware client is trying to see what files and systems it has access to and um, scanning them, or, you know, it might actually copy files from one server back to its local area, encrypt it and copy it back or delete some files. So some of these activities could be picked up by the same tools and, um, you know, through the security monitoring, of course. And so that's kind of like detection, of course. Um, but uh, also, as you know, many companies use a network and host-based um, intrusion detection systems that are set up. And so that's another way to kind of catch them while they're doing their bad deeds, you know, before it gets too late. And then if there is an incident that actually happens or is um, um, suspected, then um, of course the company has to go into the incident response, you know, um, sort of activity. But you don't just do incident response uh, when the emergency occurs, of course, right? So we all know, again, cyber professionals know that um, uh, companies should maintain, uh, update their incident response, incident response plans so that it's current and uh, workable. And uh, one way to do that, of course, is to test the incidents, incident response plan regularly, you know, at least once a year to make sure that, you know, the people that are named or their contact information is still a valid, you know, people are in the role that they were in when the plan was developed. And of course, you know, um, 
having some forensic capabilities, either internal to the organization or at least um, accessible to the organization on, upon need, that is important because if a uh, um, you know, ransomware incident occurs, then um, doing some forensic analysis will help to uh, figure out what's the best path forward, you know, whether to pay the ransom or not, is there other ways. Okay, so the last um, defense technique uh, class is, of course, you know, maintaining backups and restore uh, and restore capabilities. And so uh, basically, you know, I talked about how ransomware most often encrypts files and uh, holds the company hostage and says that you have to pay the ransom to unlock the files, right? And so backups are important in general in cybersecurity, but especially for ransomware, it is critical. And so um, there has to be a um, you know ongoing backup program in the company where they're identifying you know the critical files, systems, and even uh, you know data files and systems like operating systems uh, that uh, that are needed for continuity and to implement backups, you know, um, online backups are of course uh, important, um, but, uh, you know, for really critical uh, items, maintaining offline or air gap backups is also important so that the um, ransomware can't get to it to delete it. Uh, maintaining multiple backups, if one backup is not uh, quite complete or workable, having other options. And then of course, you know, the backups are useless unless they're tested every, every now and then to make sure that those backups can indeed be used to uh, restore the files when needed, when the emergency occurs, right? So all of these are um, proactive measures, but when we need to restore, it becomes reactive, of course. Okay, so so that's my talk. And, you know, the summary is as follows. I mean, I talked about how ransomware attacks can be highly disruptive to organizations, and not just that organization, but, you know, if that organization is serving a broader community, such as I talked about, you know, the meatpacking company or a uh, colonial pipeline um, um, distributing gas to, uh, you know, huge number of people, it can affect huge communities uh, as such, you know. Um, and so, uh, so and, and any and every organization can become a target. We've seen that with the, you know, news items about ransomware that we've been reading. And um, so uh, we talked about the ransomware kill chain. And um, as I said, the, it's important to understand it because once we know the steps that the bad guys are going to go through, we are better equipped to figure out how to stop them or uh, how to recover you know, from the bad deeds that they do. And we've talked about multiple lines of defense. Some of them are proactive, which build, builds our resistance to such attacks. And some of them are, of course, reactive so that we are we are more resilient in case we do become a victim of a ransomware attack. And so, you know, the bottom line is that, you know, by taking these proactive and reactive steps, uh, uh, companies can um, become much more resistant and resilient to ransomware attacks. So, so that's that's my uh, that's my uh, pitch. And um, here's my contact information if any of you want to contact me. But um, I don't know if there's time for any questions. Uh, I'd be happy to take. Take some. Hola. Hello. Hello. Eh, pasamos a la primera ronda de preguntas. La primera pregunta es eh, para el doctor. Es, ¿Qué industrias recibirán más ataques de ransomware el 2021? Well, we've already seen, I've given you three examples of in this different, <laughs> but uh, I mean, I, if I had a crystal ball, I would say that, you know, any for the attackers to get the maximum ransom, it has to be a, a organization or an industry which serves a large community because that's when, you know, it's not just in, just for their own financial uh, well-being that they're going to pay the ransom, you know, to continue operations. But uh, the fact that, you know, large communities are impacted, that makes them more, uh, you know, concerned and therefore they will be ready to pay the ransom, right? So I, I would say any organization, especially the critical infrastructure sector, you know, such as, the electric companies, water, I mean, huge communities of people will be impacted if some of these organizations uh, suffer an attack uh, and they will be, you know, ready to pay the ransom quickly because they want to stop the attack, right? So that's, that's what I would say. 
Correcto. Eh, la siguiente pregunta, ¿qué esperamos de la próxima generación de ransomware? What do we Yeah, um, I guess they're going to get more and more stealthy. They're going to get more and more stealthy, figure out ways to evade detection until they strike. And so, um, so I guess so far, most of the ransomware, as I mentioned, um, is about encrypting files and, uh, you know, holding files hostage until you pay. But, um, you know, the next generation could get more creative, um, you know, using uh, like techniques such as, you know, stealing the files and threatening to reveal them. We haven't seen too much of that, but you know, that could become another method of collecting ransom, especially if we're talking about, um, uh, you know, like the IP, the intellectual property uh, of a company, if that is stolen and then the uh, ransom uh, you know, attackers, ransomware attackers, they're saying that we will reveal this to your competitor if you don't pay us the ransom. So companies will pay that very quietly and not even take it to law enforcement authorities in many cases. So so I guess they're, they're definitely going to get more creative and um, And the larger and larger payments, I guess, the, when they figure out who are the high value targets, you know, what companies or what the, um, sort of sectors of the business will be ready to pay um, large amounts of money, that would be good. But uh, another thing I was reading was um, about this from a, you know, uh, let's see, insurance perspective. So many companies today, they are paying for um, cyber insurance, you know, to protect themselves against cyber attacks. And so ransomware, of course, it you know falls within that uh, scope. And so the companies that are that have big uh, cyber insurance policies, that those companies might become you know more likely targets because the uh, attackers know that um, you know there is insurance, and for both the company and the insurance provider, it might be easier to just pay the ransom up rather than to uh, you know resist and and incur much more costs, many more costs, you know. So they might be sort of figuring out, okay, where can I go not only to get a big ransom, but who can afford it, you know, who has insurance policies which will make them feel that, yes, sure, you know, we're protected. So yeah, insurance company, just pay up, you know. Any other questions? Tenemos la siguiente pregunta que la hace Mauricio Troncoso. La pregunta es, ¿deberían las empresas negociar con los atacantes de ransomware para recuperar la información cifrada? Eh, la pregunta llega a cargo de... Mauricio Troncoso, y la pregunta es, ¿deberían las empresas negociar con los atacantes de ransomware para recuperar la información cifrada? Sorry, I don't understand Spanish, so unless somebody um, uh, translates to English, uh, I, I, I don't understand the question. You're fading out. But I think I caught the question as should the... You were fading out in the middle, but I think the question is should the companies... Las empresas deberían negociar con los atacantes para recuperar la información que fue secuestrada, que fue cifrada. Uh, I, I don't know, from what I picked up from the last question, the third question, it sounds like, you know, people are asking, sh Tango leg.
let's see, uh, should they negotiate? Yeah, well, it depends on how uh, how prepared they are to, uh, you know, how resilient they are, right? So I talked about all kinds of defense techniques. Now, if they, if they have uh, good backups of the data that was encrypted, they do not have to negotiate. I mean, that's the whole point of uh, taking these defensive measures. So they, if they have good backups that are offline that the ransomware attack did not touch, then the company doesn't need to negotiate. They can just uh, restore operations from their own backups. But if they are not prepared, that's when they have to negotiate, you know, because they have to get their operations back as soon as possible. Si hemos tenido un pequeño problema con mi colega Grover, voy a, voy a seguir yo este, eh, ayudándolo. Dear Sarvari, uh, let, me, let me see if uh, we have more questions. And that's it. This is the whole question. Uh, Grover is here with us again. Hello, Grover. Well, uh, dear Sarvari, uh, thank you for, for your support. Thank you for your good presentation. We are so happy. Um, I can see the, the everybody are happy with your presentation. Thanks a lot. And I hope uh, next to, to uh, see to next event. Okay, well, thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure. Um, and. Uh... I hope everybody has learned a little bit about ransomware and uh, can help their organizations stay a little more uh, ready to defend themselves. So thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Okay, señores, vamos a continuar entonces con lo que es el evento y bueno, ya hemos tenido lo que es el primer kino, así que vamos a hacer un pequeño break para empalmar luego con con la segunda presentación. Así que les pido por favor que no se alejen de del computador, el segundo, el segundo tema que viene también es bastante bueno, tenemos bastantes sorpresas todavía durante el día, vamos a tener más sorteos de más tiempo, así que no, no se alejen de nosotros señores, nos tomamos un cafecito y volvemos. <música> 